the theme for tonight is the gift of attention. And I adapted uh, slightly chapter two from my book for this evening together. Chapter two from the heart of who we are, realizing freedom together is the book title. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Good to see you tonight, by the way. <laughs> Thanks for flashing us with a book cover. That's sweet. Mm -hmm. So I started the top of chapter two with this quote from Seneca. If a person does not know to which port he is steering, no wind is favorable to him. I buried my dog last week. He'd been by my side for 11 and a half years. He wasn't just a loyal companion. Adopting him was the start of a new era in my life. He represented the end of isolation, the start of relation. I'd been a silent monk for over eight years. As monks, we didn't relate to each other socially, ever. When I left the monastery and adopted Banke, everything changed. Banke was named after the 17th century Japanese Zen master whose Buddhist teachings had been pivotal to me. When Banke the dog came into the picture, my life pivoted again. Suddenly, I was in relationship in a completely new way. A certain flavor of intimacy that had been entirely absent appeared. My spell of isolation was broken. I still recall the joy of feeling released from this bottle. A few weeks ago, Banke began limping after a small fall, trying to hop into the back of the car. My husband and I took him to the vet. The diagnosis, soft tissue damage. The remedy, anti-inflammatories and rest. We were diligent with medication and protocol, and we were surprised when things worsened. The memory of the specialist delivering the results of the MRI will forever be burned in my brain. It was like being in one of those Charlie Brown cartoons where the words run together as indistinguishable sounds, as if delivered by someone with marbles in their mouth, except for a few select phrases inoperable tumor, malignant cancer, degradation to the vertebrae, and you could do chemotherapy. By this point, Banke had lost use of his hind legs, so we were clear that we weren't gonna put him through chemo. By the end of the conversation, more came crashing into clear view. Though we had thought that following the MRI, we'd be putting Banke through minor herniated disc surgery, we were actually going to have to put him to sleep that day. After his death, the purity of searing grief consumed us. It had particular weight, given that my husband and I were in shock for days. Shortly following Banke's death, great mender, a Chinese medicine we had ordered just days before to support his inflammation arrived in the mail. We thought the, the issue was inflammation. We were unaware, even the night prior to his passing, that he was nearing the end of his life. We were clueless that cancer was causing this inflammation. The package of herbs is still sitting by the front door, unopened. Since we buried Banke, I've been present to the movement of my attention. Over this last week, which in some ways feels like an eternity, I've been particularly aware of the mind's conditioned temptation to gravitate toward regret. Why didn't I catch that he was sick? How did I miss his signals to me? Did I express my love for him in the fullest way possible? Was I attentive enough? Identification 
with thoughts. It's not that self-doubting thoughts are inherently bad or wrong. When such thoughts go unrecognized, however, it's easy to identify with them. To see things through the limited perspective of those thoughts. If we're fully identified with them, it then becomes easy to spiral into further story making. And spiraling into further story making is spiraling into suffering. It's in moments like these that I'm infinitely grateful for awareness practice. It's taken practice for me to recognize such thoughts as creations, to see that when the attention is fully given to them, they become a, quote, reality of sorts. They masquerade as truth. This reality keeps one thing in particular in place, the illusion of a self that is separate from life. A self that believes that whatever I do, it's never enough. A self that feels that she could have done more, should have seen more. Over the years, this is the most common block I've seen with, when working with others. Whatever I do, it's never enough. It's a Shakespearean tragedy. The hanging carrot that can never be held and eaten, only chased. The belly of the hungry ghost that is forever empty. The only result of such a constructed, quote, reality is dissatisfaction. It can be no other way. Directing the attention. Learning to place our attention where we want it to be is step one on the path toward freedom. Without this skill, our attention habitually moves from object to object, searching for something it'll never find. It is key to discover that we can redirect our attention when it's habitually starting to go down that slide of suffering. In the case of Banke, for example, without practice, my conditioned habit would be to focus on regret, to intensify it, to drown in it. That regret would rob me of the intimacy of grief, the purity of it, the heart of it. For it's clear to me that this grief is a deep expression of love. There's something exquisitely beautiful about resting in this love. I don't take it for granted. It's worth drawing my attention back to this experience again and again. Why would I miss it and at what cost? Years ago, Allison Copacino and I were offering yoga and mindfulness tools to teens after school in Portland, Oregon. Before I taught the basic meditation practice, I offered a lesson that revealed the habituated way our attention moves. So often we're not conscious of the way our attention is conditioned to bounce from thing to thing to thing, moving from object to object, seeking, longing, grasping, resisting, getting lost in experience. The teens were palpably stunned when we played a collective game around directing the attention. A student would choose an object to place in the center of the room. Then all the students in the group were asked to direct their attention to that object and simply raise their hand when they noticed the attention wander. Most were deeply surprised to learn how quickly their attention went from attending to the object to thoughts of the past or future or to an internal story or to another object entirely. The game continued. The students were instructed to consciously direct their attention back to the assigned object when they noticed their attention wander. They were asked to work that muscle of placing the attention where they wanted it to be and to practice doing it without judgment to notice what tends to get in the way. Does anything make this practice seem difficult? If so, what? What surprised me most about this game was to see 
a clear theme emerge. Students felt empowered. They felt empowered by directly experiencing two things. Seeing clearly how habituated the attention is to wander about without direction. For many teens, that was radical. And then seeing that they have the innate internal capacity to place their attention where they want it to be, to redirect, to have choice about something they had no idea they could be in choice about. So what I'd like to do now is stop to pause for a moment. So I'm gonna keep track of the time. We'll just do this for a few minutes. And I'd like you, please, friends, to simply notice where your attention goes during this time. I want you to pay attention to how it moves. You could choose the breath as we did in today's meditation, sensations in the body or sounds around you as an anchor. And that when you see that your attention's wandered, you'll gently bring it back and place it on your anchor, specifically paying attention to where your attention's habituated to go. So I'll pause now for a few moments and invite this inquiry. So you're attending to the attention. Specifically noticing where it's habituated to go. What's the rut? What's the groove? Okay, friends, let me know in the chat. In this moment, where is your attention habituated to go? Did it feel easeful, just as it may have in tonight's meditation, to stay with that breath practice? Or did it feel clear that the attention habitually went to past or regret, as in the story I shared this evening? Beautiful the next thing on my to-do list. Scanning my surroundings for security. Thank you for your comment, Mark. The next thing on my to-do list, you all, we all have full to-do lists, don't we? <laughs> Fears, worries, the worries I have about health, thoughts that I'm not doing it, watching me trying to pay attention, feeling like I'm not doing it to sounds, physical sensations, then the breath. Attention to the, to the left ear ringing, feeling like you could get absorbed in it. Bodily comfort, being present to bodily pain, the loss of my wife. Wandering into practical fantasy. Sharon, you don't have a full to-do list. Most often, past foul-ups, and then back to the to-do list. So friends, this is helpful. I wanted to bring attention to what our conditioned habit is and to be able to ask, does this habit lead towards suffering? Does it lead away from suffering? So when your mind is left to its own condition pattern of activity, what's, what's revealed? I'm curious, does it, do, do these habituated grooves again lead towards suffering or away from it? What did, what did you notice? Again, feel free to type in the chat if you would like. Lead, these these habits lead to insatisfaction towards anxiety, towards suffering. I get so stressed towards worry, worry specifically about the future. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. Any grievance will will do. Yes, thank you, Ruth. Good to see that that's the patterned behavior. That's the patterned thought form. And of course, it's it's interesting that the word to me it's interesting that the word behavior just arose because the behaviors, of course, arise out of these thought patterns. So, what happened when you redirected your attention to presence? to the experience of being here and now? What happened when you placed your attention where you wanted it to be? And what in general tends to happen when you direct the attention to what's here and now, or maybe specifically based on some of the shares I've been reading in the comments in the chat, when you direct the attention to the love that is here and now? Michelle, thank you. Coming back to your voice reminds me I'm safe. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, friends, for these comments. So this all is an exploration. To the best of your ability, you're just watching for any conditioned tendency to give the right answer, and you're exploring with non-judgmental inquiry, what is, what are the grooves? What is my conditioned habit? Again, conditioned habit meaning the, the habits that are shaped by society, the conditioned mind, the, the mind that is shaped by society, culture, family, friends. What I'd like to point to next around the attention is that energy follows attention. Consider how this notion might be true in your own experience. How does energy or life force follow where your attention lands? So I wanted to offer an example. I encourage you to find your own examples of how your energy or life force follows your attention. So if my attention is consistently directed toward the condition standard that suggests I need to be thin in order to be lovable, for example, then energy is, about, is bound to follow. Imagine a mind filled with thoughts about the importance of being thin, comparing myself to others, judging myself for gaining weight. It's not hard to imagine those thoughts leading to behaviors, as I mentioned before, perhaps obsessively working out or even developing an eating disorder. Energy follows attention. So picture a flashlight. The beam of light illuminates whatever it lands on. Now, imagine that this light isn't being consciously directed. Perhaps instead it's on autopilot, shifting from object to object, bouncing randomly and quickly. We may think that our experience is varying a great deal based on the fact that these illuminated objects appear to be different. Light landing on a chair is different from light landing on a dog. Now, consider objects that are less neutral. Imagine the light of your attention landing on an internal story about not being good enough. And now the light is landing on longing for something that will never be. And now it has shifted to regret. What in your experience is the result of this? Again, we might think that our experience varies a great deal based on the variation of thoughts, but ask yourself, what is the outcome of this process of thinking? Once you've noticed where the attention lands, then you can consciously redirect it to something here and now, perhaps feeling the rising of your breath and the falling of your breath, perhaps this dental floss breath, perhaps the sounds in the room, maybe this sensation in the soles of your feet. What happens? I'm not suggesting that if your attention lands on something negative, you should simply redirect it to something positive or that redirecting your attention equals 
getting rid of thoughts. This is about bringing attention to the present moment as thoughts arise. And this is an important point for tonight's teaching, friends. What we are unconscious to silently governs us. This practice is about seeing where our attention habitually lends, noticing the effect of this, and then consciously redirecting it to what's real, to the present moment, to what's true. This is about realizing that this flashlight is in our hand. It's about realizing that we have choice. We can choose where our attention lands and thereby where our attention will be directed. The quality of our lives is dramatically affected by the focus of our attention. In this practice of directing the attention, the mind becomes steady. Personal narratives that feed the illusion that we are a self that is separate from life fade. Presence is revealed. But those are just nice ideas until you test them out for yourself. And I encourage you to do so. I can't underline enough that your experience will be your greatest test of reality. It'll be your greatest proof of what's true. You are not your thoughts. So one day while I was teaching the teens after school, the principal came by to observe what we were offering. It wasn't the first time, and I'd started to recognize that my inner dialogue around whether he had concerns about what we were teaching was coming up. I knew what we were doing was radical. We were teaching teens to recognize conditioned thought patterns, to unhook from stories about themselves, each other, and life, and to explore who they truly are beyond who they've been conditioned to perceive themselves to be. There's something deeply uh, subversive about this. As the principal hovered, I recalled remembering to practice what I had preached, noticing my thoughts, recognizing them as creations, consciously redirecting my attention to the breath to I don't know mind, to presence. I saw that there was no way for me to know if my stories about why he was there were, quote, true. I don't know mind could be trusted. It was based on reality. It always is. So returning the attention to reality, to the moment, allows us to be freed from the story that the world revolves around us. It frees us from looking through the habituated lens of limitation. It allows us to rest in being, to trust. The principal, Brian Chatard, pulled me aside, and then it turned out that his response to what we were doing was far from a raised eyebrow. There had been a school suicide the year before. I learned that, though Brian knew little about mindfulness, it was clear to him that we were offering students a form of wellness that the institution lacked, and he wanted to reach more than a large handful of teens at a time. He saw a dire need to do so. I knew there was no way we'd reach more students as an after-school program, so I asserted that the class would need to be offered during the school day, just as any other credited elective course was. Having been a monastic and having never worked deeply in the belly of public education, I was unaware that this hadn't been done before. I mean, to me, it just simply made sense. Brian invited us to offer demonstration classes for 10th graders to give them a taste of what a semester long course in mindfulness might feel like. And he said that if 20 to 30 students expressed interest in the class, he'd figure out how to weave it in the school day. We were placed in the high school gym. I still don't know why, but I didn't question it. I recognized it as a grand opportunity. And on one particularly stunning spring day in 2014, students entered the gym, dressed down to play basketball, only to find yoga mats and meditation cushions in the circle. Now this is more common in the classrooms. 
but it wasn't then. And we offered two days of demonstrations that included this attention practice. Somewhere near the end of each 90 minute class, I would drop the phrase, you are not your thoughts. And thank you for what's happening in the chat. You are not your thoughts. Don't believe everything you think. It's human theater. Yes, you're right there with me. The silence was profound, especially given the number of young people gathered in one place. You could almost hear the silent self-talk, this internal dialogue that often runs in the backdrop of our minds. Well, if you're not your thoughts, then who are you? Their interest was piqued. Brian called me several days later. We've created a monster, he said. Over 300 teens have signed up for your class. I have absolutely no idea what to do about it. In the fall of 2014, we launched three sections of the first four credit semester long mindfulness course. And years later, our programs in many Portland schools were offering trainings and continue to expand into California and elsewhere beyond Portland. And our curriculum still offers lessons about learning to direct the attention. We do this, we teach this before even teaching formal meditation. And what's one of the most important themes of this lesson, focused on directing the attention? Energy follows attention. So friends, I would like to pause there now for some more direct engagement with you. So please tell me what's alive for you about the attention. Tell me what you're present to, what you're noticing. If you'd like to put something in the chat, you are welcome to. And this is also a wonderful opportunity to have direct engagement. And I'd love to have someone come on screen to have as many people as might wish come on screen to have an exchange. Am I saying your name right, Ole? Uh, Ole is close enough. Um, okay. They say back in Iowa, just don't call me late for dinner. All right, Ole. <laughs> yeah, so um, what's going on right now? Well, a while back, I discovered uh, the Seagull's Wheel of Awareness. Yes. You gave a talk on it at Toastmasters this morning. So more and more, I find myself checking in. Okay. What's happening around me? What's happening in the body? Achy knees. Uh, what's happening upstairs? God, get paranoid about that again. Come on, dude. Let's relax. Um, you know, how, how are my relationships doing? Some of them are good. Some of them I need to do some fence building. So that that's where I am more and more after decades of rumination and got to do it my way, you know, and... Uh, um, so in a nutshell, that's where I am. Um, uh, I rapidly ate a tuna salad and baked potato dinner and I'm still hanging on digesting that. So that's going on inside. If you're, you know, just doing a, a check of all the instrument gauges, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the other thing I learned was from Shauna Shapiro, UC UCSB Santa Barbara, wrote a book about looking at What's my intent? Where's my attention? And what's my attitude? And that that's another set of gauges I found to be useful. And, and you're just doing a marvelous job of reinforcing it. Thank you ever so much. Well, thank you, Ole. I really, yeah, I appreciate you saying hello and giving us a little temperature check of of what's alive in your practice right now. And, and I want to just reflect back to you that you've found a lot of resources that you found uh, that you've uh, experienced as supportive and nourishing and wonderful. I'm so happy to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, one more comment and I'll tune out. Uh, as one of my Toastmasters colleagues from Portland said, and I can't recall her name right now, darn it. But she wrote a very nice article, and at the bottom was, she wrote, practice, comma, takes practice. And she's so right. Thank you, Ollie. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, Bruce. Hey, Bruce. I just, great. Got it. <laughs> I Hi, know Bruce. I don't mute. This is amazing. What are we doing? 
What are we doing right now? Yes. Right now, Bruce, we are being, and okay. we're being in community together, and we're pausing to see what where's the attention in this moment? What's alive in this moment? Is my attention moving in habitual ways? And if so, what are those habitual ways? How I'm how might I redirect the attention to the present moment? And in this specific moment, we're just looking to see, is there any way you'd like to engage with me on that topic? Is there anything alive in your practice? Are there any questions or comments from what I've shared tonight? I can share that I did an amazing 90-minute meditation this morning. Uh, I usually wake up early and up in the morning so I can do an extended meditation. And what is really alive for me right now is this sense of, I, I think it's primate, ape, aggression, don't m mess with me stuff. <laughs> Because here's the situation I'm in. Uh, I have asthma, which is probably the only thing wrong wrong with me, luckily, right now. And the uh, the company that manufactured my preventative asthma inhaler stopped making their product on December 31st of 2023. I didn't know that until I went for a refill and it just said discontinued. And it sat there until I went to pick it up. And then I had to get another drug approved and I still, this was on April 8th of this year and I still don't have a refill for something to keep me healthy. And it's been a comedy of errors between my doctors prescribing the wrong strength of the wrong medication. They had nasal first. They don't understand what kind of inhaler I need. And the insurance company denying the claims because it's not in the formulary because they didn't even know the drug had been discontinued. And it's just been this ongoing thing. And today, some of it was, um, oh, I, I asked, just transfer the thing to wa my nearest Walgreens. I will pay for it out of pocket and then we'll fight it out, right? They were willing to do that. They sent it to the wrong pharmacy at the wrong prescription strength, like three times as much as I need. So I'm just in the middle of this comedy of errors kind of thing. And I was I was realizing that, you know, I, you know, I, who's really deep down here is completely okay. But all around me, there's this circus going on. And it's this, you know, this primate instinct, you cannot, you know, I will win this battle eventually, no, no matter what it takes, because I am in the right here, et cetera, et cetera you know, concern for other people who are going through this kind of nonsense to, especially with asthma, because their asthma is getting progressively worse as mine is, you know, the longer they're denied medication. So it's the self-righteousness mix in with the ape stuff. And that's kind of, and I was aware that, you know, uh, while I was meditating, I was going to get up and look something up or get up and make a phone call or get up and, you know, interrupt my practice to do this or that but i i stayed with it and watched the feelings all the time and it was just interesting may I, may I ask you a question about it sure sure so thank you for sharing your experience i'm curious you've mentioned several times there this comedy of errors as you share the story you're you're smiling so i can hear that in your practice you can see the part of you that's in survival mode this kind of like sense you you refer to it as sort of this ape-like experience of just wanting to survive but there's something in you that allows you to see this as a comedy that that's not caught up believing even though it relates to the breath that this is in fact life and death you're 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 able to see the um the the lightness in a, in a way that if you were solely identified with this survival part of you, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to see. So that's what I'd like to to pause you to reflect back to you um, regarding practice. That's that's what's important to me uh, in this exchange is that you can direct your attention to the part of you that's going to be busy trying to survive and deeply stressed and freaking out. Or you can direct your attention to the part of you that can see this as a comedy of errors um, while still trying to get this prescription worked out, right? So so I just wanna speak to this, um, the importance of recognizing it's, it's not what, it's how. It's not the content of our lives that is creating all the problems as much as we tend to believe that 
the content of our lives is responsible for our, our experience. But as I mentioned in this sharing tonight, the, the quality of our lives is determined by where we're placing our attention. So you're doing a, a beautiful job displaying that if you place your attention beyond that survival strategy, you're gonna have a different life experience. So thank you, Bruce, for for sharing that tonight. Yeah, thank, you, thank you for playing along with my- Yeah, absolutely. Because the, the comedy is there's this person with a social security number and an insurance card, but that's not me. You know, that's somebody yeah, the government I invented. Totally, yeah. yeah, yeah, keeping that perspective, a broad view is incredibly important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Caverly, before yeah. uh, we have one of the other raised hands, there was a question from Adele who was having some trouble. Okay. Um, and and uh, she says her question is, can you say more on the thought habituation of whatever I do, it's not enough? Um, yes. Resonated. So if you could speak to that and then we'll go back to, um, to Sheila and to Jogan. Yeah, thank you so much, Kathleen. In my years of working with others, it really is one of the most common blocks that I see. The block that doesn't allow us to move forward freely in our life. And the block is whatever I do, it's not enough. So many of us have some version of that going on. So it's a mental formation that keeps us from being able to move forward freely in our lives. If in, in light of tonight's theme, if I'm constantly feeding that narrative with my attention, whatever I do isn't enough. Because energy follows attention, my life will look a particular way. It will become a self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts. So one of the things I wanted to focus on tonight is what shifts when we're consciously directing our attention. We notice those thought forms, that pattern, but we're consciously directing our attention back to center, back to presence, rather than feeding um, that narrative, which is such an incredibly debilitating block for so many of us. So thank you, um, Kathleen, for sharing Adele's question. Yeah, and um, we had a question from admin, but I think you just answered it. Can you talk about, oh, it just disappeared. Um, yeah, can you talk about how to put attention on something and at the same time not getting caught in desire? But what I just heard you say is bring your attention to the presence. I don't know if you want to say anything more. Yes, yes. So desire is not bad and it's not wrong, but it's another place that if I if I am completely identified with desire without seeing maybe the part of me who's caught in desire for who who they are, I won't be able to return to that question that I asked in tonight's offering. What's leading towards suffering and what's leading away from it, right? So a desire to wake up and be free might not be something that I would say is leading towards suffering, but it's still a desire. What happens when I direct my attention to, as you say, Kathleen, to presence, to that longing to remember who I am, the heart of who I am, to remember presence, to remember being, to... Uh, to not be swept by the habits of the mind. Thank you. Thank how about you. If, how about if we go to Jovian with his race? Jovian, hello. Patience. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, thank you so much, Caverly. That was wonderful. Um, so this is uh, somewhat similar to Bruce's question um, or comment. Um, so uh, I have a lot of autoimmune symptoms, um, a lot of uh, issues with the body. Um, and, uh, you, uh, and I recently had a problem with my eye and I um, had to take steroids for it, some very strong steroids to get the iris inflammation to go down. And um, it was just so interesting and uh, unpleasant, to be honest, um, what that did to my consciousness, because, you know, I'm so aware 
and you brought this up in your talk and I resonated with it so much that we are just part of the energetic flow of life. So what's happening in this body is not really all that important, right? It's like you, there, you, there's the inhalation, there's a life, the exhalation, there's, there's a death, right? And the, the, the death creates the soil from which new life flows. And so I'm well aware of this, but when you're stuck in like a state where you're feeling like super agitated um, and your attention is focused there, um, how do, um, and, and I'm, and I'm starting to try to use a practice as sort of like a, you know, a palliative care. It's like, how can I downregulate my immune system rather, rather than how can I just be, um, how do I, um, return to that place of stillness of knowing that no matter how uh, disrupted and dysregulated things feel internally um, that there is something more expansive because i'm aware of it intellectually while it's happening but all i'm feeling is is the body right and i know the body is important it's it's the vessel that carries you know the, the temple of the soul right so but um at the same time i'm not my body i'm not my thoughts i'm not my feelings i'm not my sensations and how do i focus on the blue sky behind the gray clouds rather than the gray clouds well do i say your name jovan uh yes that's correct okay great <laughs> so i want to start by saying thank you for sharing your experience and I'd love to still be able to see you. You just you just went away somewhere. So I'm just going to see if I can find you. Um, but I, I want to say, there you are. Thank you. Stay with me here. <laughs> I, I really appreciate being able to see you. And I appreciate you sharing me in this, sharing with me in this way. Mm -hmm. So, Jovian, you you have all the right answers, quote unquote, you have this wonderful analogy and practice of recognizing yourself as the sky and these clouds are just coming through and this, the cloud doesn't disturb the sky. You, you also, you also know the value of recognizing consciousness, right? And, and, and how the consciousness, even though you said, Jovian, you know, I know I'm not the body. So even though there's this recognition that consciousness is bigger than just something that's limited to the body, what you're describing is that those are intellectual understandings in this moment. That mm -hmm. is not bad. It's not wrong. It's actually really helpful. And you can let the mind um, enjoy playing around with those understandings while you Jovian, pause to access love. In this moment, Jovian, love is your doorway in. You don't, you don't, you don't need more understanding. Mm -hmm. I want to invite you to let the mind soften in the heart. Let the mind sink into the heart and, and find Jovian that part of you who has been through so much physically. Like see, see that part of you and, and let that part of you be completely embraced by the loving gaze of your attention. They, how old do you feel when you're in pain and you're frustrated that you, you can't change it and you don't want to be on these drugs, but then there's a drug, you know, how, how old do you feel? Oh yeah. It's, it's like six, seven years old. Six or seven right? years old, six or seven years old kid doesn't, when they're in pain, they don't want to just be told, oh, but you're just the sky or you are not just body. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're like, screw you. <laughs> not helpful to me. Yeah. They want someone to hold them. They want a hug. Yeah. They want to hug. They want to be reminded that they are love mm -hmm. and they're held in love. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Jovian. Thank you so much.